thank you. Um, an answer to that title, Noah Porter Professor. You know who Noah Porter was. Noah Porter was, um, well, when I was appointed to the chair, I thought I ought to find out who Noah Porter was. So I looked it up. He, he was a former professor of Yale. So I read about him. Um, all the evidence pointed to the fact that he was a mediocre scholar, a mediocre teacher, a mediocre bureaucrat, but everybody ag agreed that he was a wonderful human being. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have to take your choice. Uh... <laughs> every Christian liturgy and every enactment of a Christian liturgy gives explicit expression to a certain understanding of God. The liturgy for the Eucharist of the Episcopal Church begins with the, with the celebrant saying, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the blessing spoken by the celebrant makes explicit that God is understood as a trinity. But in every Christian liturgy and in every enactment of a Christian liturgy, there is also an understanding of God implicit in the liturgical acts. That opening sentence of the Episcopal liturgy takes for granted that God is one who is appropriately blessed. The celebrant doesn't say that God is appropriately blessed. And so, of course, he doesn't explain, he or she doesn't explain what it is about God that makes it appropriate to bless God. He or she just blesses God. My project in these le lectures is to make explicit and to articulate some aspects of the understanding of God implicit, and here and there explicit, in the Christian liturgy. In the preceding lecture, we considered the understanding of God implicit in the Christian liturgy as a whole. God, I concluded, is implicitly understood as being of unsurpassable excellence, worthy of awed reverential adoration. Let's now move on to the understanding of God implicit in some of the fundamental types of liturgical actions. So I think of this as moving to the next level up. The liturgy for the Eucharist of the Episcopal Church has two rites. Both rites open with the blessing quoted above, spoken by the priest, followed by the people saying, and blessed be his kingdom forever, now and forever. These blessings are followed immediately by a prayer addressed to God, spoken by the celebrant. The text of the prayer is the same in the two rites, except that the pronominal references to God are updated in Right too. That is, thee is replaced by you, thy by your, and so forth. So let me quote the text of the prayer as it occurs in right two. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord to which the people say, Amen. This opening prayer, then, is the first occurrence of a type of action that recurs repeatedly in the Episcopal liturgy, as it does in all mainline Christian liturgies. The people, the celebrant, or both together, address God with second-person pronouns. To hammer home the point, let me give some other examples from right two of the Episcopal liturgy. On certain Sundays, the singing of the ancient hymn, Glory to God in the Highest, follows immediately upon the opening prayer. And the opening lines of the ancient hymn go like this. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. The opening sentence of the text for the confession of sins goes like this. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Right 2 contains a number of options for the text of the intercessory prayers. The text of Form 6 begins with the sentence, In peace we pray to you, Lord God, and it concludes with this sentence, Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown things done and left undone. 
And so uphold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Two versions of the text for the great thanksgiving at the beginning of Holy Communion begin with the words, It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And this is followed by the celebrant praying a preface proper for the day, after which the celebrant says, Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. And one version of the text for the prayer said by celebrants and people after communion goes as follows. Heavenly Father, eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness of heart, gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. You get the point. Over and over and over, the celebrant and the people address God with second-person pronouns. One can, of course, address God without explicitly using second-person pronouns. Thus, one wonders, for example, whether or not the opening line in the Episcopal liturgy Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is to be understood as an address to God with an implicit you referring to God. Blessed be you, Father, God, and Holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the opening line in the Catholic liturgy of the Eucharist is a blessing that does use a second person pronoun to refer to God, and is thus unambiguously addressed to God. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. So might it be that that opening blessing in the Episcopal liturgy should also be understood as implicitly addressed to God? That would be possible except for the fact that the people say in response, blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Not your kingdom, but his kingdom. So God has spoken about in the opening blessing, not spoken to. The hymn, Glory to God in the Highest, uses the second person pronoun explicitly. So clearly that hymn is addressed to God. But a good, good many other hymns speak of God without using a second person pronoun, thereby often leaving it ambiguous as to whether or not they're addressed to God. One can, after all, praise someone without addressing them. We who are professors do this when we write recommendations for former students and friends. I remarked above that acts of addressing God occur repeatedly in mainline Christian liturgies. Praise of God is addressed to God. Thanksgiving for what God has done is addressed to God. Confession of sin is addressed to God. Intercessions are addressed to God. Supplications of other sorts are addressed to God. And so forth, on and on. Let me now make a stronger claim. In all mainline liturgies, Orthodox, Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran, Reformed, not just some liturgical actions or acts of addressing God, but most of them are of that type. This is not true, obviously, for those groups of Protestants whose Sunday service is little more than sermon. And in no liturgy do all liturgical acts take the form of addressing God, expressing expressing one's attitudinal stance of awed reverential adoration by kneeling or bowing is not, strictly speaking, an address to God. And so, too, eating the bread and drinking the wine of the Eucharist are not instances of addressing God. So it's not true that everything is addressing God, but I submit that the most pervasive type is, in fact, addressed to God. So from the pervasiveness of acts of addressing God in the liturgy, it follows that whatever be the understanding of God implicit in addressing God is more pervasive in traditional liturgies than any other understanding. Of course, every act of addressing God takes some particular form, the form of praise, the form of confession, the form of intercession, whatever. And implicit in those particular forms of address to God will be some particular understanding of God. But all those particular understandings 
of God presuppose the understanding of God implicit in the act as such of addressing God. That understanding, whatever it is, is fundamental in the Christian liturgy. To discern the understanding of God implicit in addressing God, we need some understanding of what it is to address somebody. In later lectures, I'm going to have something more to say on the matter, but let's begin our reflections here today. In some Episcopal parishes, there is an annual blessing of the animals. De facto, what this amounts to, in most areas anyway, is a blessing of the parishioners' pets. That is, people don't bring horses and cows and pigs into the uh, churchyard. People bring their pets into the churchyard, and the priest blesses them. I looked it up, and the Book of Common Prayer does not include a liturgy for this blessing of the animals. I don't know whether there is nonetheless a standard liturgy for this blessing, or whether each parish devises its own liturgy. You know, some of you can maybe inform me on that uh, afterwards. I've never attended such a blessing of the animals. But I would not be surprised to learn that in blessing the animals, the priest refers to them with the second person pronoun, you. Naturally, the priest does not expect that the creatures he refers to as you will realize that they are being addressed. The point of blessing them is not undermined by not apprehending that they're being blessed. So too, a priest might pronounce a blessing over someone in a personal coma, referring to the person as you, but with no expectation that the person apprehends that he or she is being blessed. Now, it's not clear to me whether or not it's correct English usage to say that in blessing the animals that he refers to as you, the priest is addressing the animals. I don't know. Nor is it clear to me whether or not it's correct English usage to say that in blessing somebody in a coma whom he refers to as you, the priest is addressing the comatose human being. So, too, it's not clear to me whether or not it's correct English usage to say that the person who exclaims, gazing at Pike's Peak, oh, may you never lose your snow cap, is addressing Pike's Peak. Nor whether, and it's not clear to me whether or not it's correct to say that the person who says, petting her dog, you sweet little thing, is addressing her dog. Are these cases in which somebody or somebody, something is addressed? even though the adversary is incapable of realizing that they're addressed? Or are there cases in which, though something or somebody is referred to as you, the reference is not addressed, because it's not capable of realizing that it's addressed? Can one perform a speech act in which one refers to someone or something as you without addressing the being so referred to? Or is the use of you an infallible indicator of address? I don't know, so I'm not going to try to answer the question. <laughs> Let me instead introduce the term strong address for addressing somebody in the expectation or hope that one's addressee will realize that they're being addressed. Whether all address is strong address, or whether there's also what you might call weak address, which is addressing animals and Pikes Peak and comatose people and so forth. Um, that's a question we needn't answer. Henceforth, when I use the term address, without qualification, understand me as meaning strong address. So here's the question. What is it to strongly address someone? Among the many different sorts of speech acts that we perform, what is distinctive about strongly addressing someone? I would say that for me to address Malchus is to perform a speech act with the aim or purpose that Malchus will attend to what I say, will grasp it, and will respond appropriately. Will attend, take note of what I say, will catch it, grasp it, and will respond appropriately. That's my aim or purpose. Should I fail in my aim? Should Malchus not attend to what I say? not grasp it, or not respond appropriately, I will still have addressed him, even though my aim in addressing him has not been achieved. 
It is, of course, possible for my attempt to address Malchus to go amiss so badly that I don't even succeed in addressing him. Maybe I mistakenly address somebody else instead, or maybe I don't address anybody at all. But here's the point. Success in addressing Malchus doesn't depend on success in my aim of Malchus attending to what I say, grasping it, and responding appropriately. What is the case is that my performing the act of addressing Malchus depends on having those acts, that he'll attend to it, grasp it, and respond appropriately, having those acts as my aim or my purpose. When addressing Malchus, I might want somebody else whom, I, whom I'm not addressing, Martha, let us say, to overhear what I'm saying to Malchus. I may want Martha to attend to and grasp what I say. So we have to distinguish between having it as one's aim or purpose that a certain person will attend to, grasp, and respond appropriately to what one says, and wanting somebody to attend to and grasp what one says. Wanting one's action to have some effect doesn't turn that effect into one's purpose in performing the action. Think of it like this. My purpose in addressing Malchus is not frustrated if for some reason Martha happens not to overhear what I say. But my purpose in addressing Malchus is frustrated if Malchus doesn't attend to, grasp, and respond appropriately. Naturally, there will be borderline cases in which it's just not so clear whether you're addressing somebody or just wanting somebody to overhear. If the purpose of my action is that Malchus attend to what I say, grasp it, and respond appropriately, then Malchus has been singled out in such a way that I can refer to him as you, whether or not I actually happen to use the second person pronoun. Referring to Malchus with the second person pronoun, I can preface what I say with the words, to you I say. If there's no one to whom I, whom I can single out in that way, to you I say, then it's not a case of my having addressed somebody. If I want Martha only to overhear what I say to Michael, then I cannot, referring to her, preface what I say with the words, to you I say. If I address Malchus, next point, if I address Malchus, then I assume that he can attend to what I say and can grasp it. To, say, to save words, let me say that I assume that Malchus can listen to what I say, can both attend and grasp. This is to stretch the ordinary term listen, though we address others both in speech and in writing. In ordinary usage, it's only the former that we describe as listening. Being incapable of listening comes in two forms. First, most entities are ontologically incapable of listening. Mountains, numbers, stars, wetlands, none of them can listen. Accordingly, one is seriously unless one is seriously confused, one will not strongly address any of them. Second, among the entities that are ontologically capable of listening, some will be incapable of listening to ones addressed to them because they're not in a position to do so. They lack the requisite know-how, they're off at too great a distance, or whatever. I address somebody in English on the, understand, on the assumption that she understands English. But as it turns out, she only understands Turkish. And so she cannot grasp what I said. She can't listen to it, grasp and, grasp and uh, respond. She cannot attend and grasp. So if I address Michael, but if I address Michael, I not only assume that he's capable of listening to what I say, I also assume that he's capable of responding appropriately. And in the ordinary case, I not only assume that he's capable of doing these things, I think I address him in the expectation that he will listen, not just can, but will, or that there's a good chance anyway that he will, and in the hope or expectation that he will respond appropriately. My expectation that he will attend and grasp what I say may, of course, not pan out. He may be distracted and not notice that I'm addressing him, 
Or he may attend to what I'm saying, but find that he doesn't get it. So too, he may attend and to and grasp what I say, but not respond as I expected or hoped. He may be completely unresponsive, or he may respond in a way that utterly dismays me. So pull it together like this. To strongly address someone is to expect or hope for a certain reciprocity of orientation. I orient myself toward my addressee in the expectation that he or she will in turn orient themselves towards me by listening. And in the expectation or hope that they will then also orient themselves to me by responding appropriately. Suppose that my expectations of mutuality are gratified. Suppose that I address Malchus as you, and that he listens to what I say and responds appropriately. Or even suppose that he just listens to what I say, whether or not he responds appropriately. Now let me borrow the English title of Martin Buber's famous book and say that the combination of my addressing Malchus as you and his listening to what I said creates between us an I-thou relationship. This relationship is not an ontological fact about us. It's not in the nature of things that we stand in this relationship. The relationship is brought into existence created by my addressing him as you and by his listening. I can think about Melchus. I can talk about Melchus. I can shake hands with Melchus. None of those ways of engaging Melchus creates an I-thou relationship between the two of us. For that to happen, I have to address him as you, and he has to listen. Or he has to address me as you, and I have to listen. Obviously, it can go either way. And now for what we wanted to get up to, God as listener. These general points concerning what it is to address someone apply to our addressing God. I hold that our liturgical acts of addressing God are acts of strong address. We address God with the aim or purpose that God will listen to what we say and respond appropriately. In doing so, we assume that God can listen, that God is both ontologically capable of listening as, and is in a position to do so. And we assume that God can respond favorably. I think more than that, not just can, we address God in the expectation that God not only can, but will listen. Or maybe better than expectation in the confidence that God will listen. And we do so with the desire, at least, that God will respond favorably to what we say. In short, the understanding of God implicit in liturgical acts of addressing God no matter what the particular content of those acts, is that God is one who can and does listen to us, and who can respond favorably to what we say. And if God does in fact listen, there, then there is this reciprocity of orientation. We are oriented toward God in addressing God, and God is oriented toward us in listening. And that reciprocity of orientation brings into existence an I-thou relationship between God and us. God has become a thou for us. <laughs> Apart from the understanding of God as unsurpassably great that is implicit in worship in general, the understanding of God is one who can and does listen to us and is capable of responding favor favorably to what we say, is, I submit, more pervasive in traditional liturgies than any other, that understanding, by virtue of the fact that most liturgical acts in those liturgies take the form of address to God. And it's more fundamental 
than any other understanding of God implicit in those acts. The understanding of God implicit in our liturgical act of confessing our sins to God and asking for God's forgiveness is that God can be wronged and can forgive. But more fundamental than the understanding of God implicit in that particular content of our address to God is the understanding of God implicit in the very act of addressing God. My claim that apart from the understanding of God as unsurpassably great, which is true for the liturgy as a whole, the implicit understanding of God that is most pervasive and fundamental in lit traditional liturgies is that of God as listener may well take some of you by surprise. In a half-conscious way, we all know that it's true. Many of those not familiar with the passages from the Episcopal liturgy that I quoted will know of similar passages from other traditional liturgies. But most of us have been schooled to think of God primarily as agent. A good many of us have written about God speaking or revealing, myself included. Very few of us have written about God as listening, myself, again, until this lecture, included. Indeed, I don't know of any theologian or philosopher who has written in a sustained way about God as listener. So I have no interlocutors on this point. When participating in the liturgy, we are naturally more aware of the content of our address to God, praise, thanksgiving, petition, and so forth, than we are of its basic structure. Namely, that whatever its content, it's addressed to God and presupposes God as listener. And of course, for many people, liturgy is primarily sermon. These factors all conspire to make us overlook the fact that, apart from the understanding of God implicit in worship itself, the understanding most pervasive and most fundamental in most traditional liturgies is that of God as one who can and does listen to us and is capable of responding appropriately. God as listener. I said that when we address God in the liturgy, we do so in the expectation that God will listen and in the hope or desire that God will respond favorably. Sometimes the desire that God will respond favorably remains implicit. But often it's given liturgical expression. To our confession of sin, we add, Lord, have mercy. To our intercessions, we add, Lord, have mercy, or Lord, hear our prayers. Toward the end of Eucharistic prayer, two of the Episcopal liturgy, the celebrant says, accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Each of these liturgical acclamations gives expression to our desire that God will respond favorably to the content of that particular address. I observe that the understanding of God implicit in the desire that God will respond favorably is that God is capable of responding favorably. These liturgical expressions of that desire indicate that something more precise should be said. Namely, they indicate that God is implicitly understood as free to respond as God wishes. Otherwise, why would you say, hear, O Lord? God is not bound to respond in a way that we regard as favorable, nor indeed in any other way. So a fundamental assumption of the Christian liturgy is that the liturgy is not a device for manipulating God. God cannot be manipulated. God is free. I'll have more to say on that in a subsequent lecture. Now, God as speaker. In traditional liturgies, a good many of those actions of the people that don't consist of their addressing God consist of the people listening. In some free church Protestant liturgies, almost all the actions consist of the people listening, the main exception being congregational singing, which, if they're using a praise band, has uh, not even that happens very much. 
To whom are the people listening? Well, to the minister, obviously. The celebrant, the leader, the reader. But is that all? In the Episcopal liturgy, at the conclusion of the first and second readings from Scripture, the reader says, this is the word of the Lord. The reader introduces the reading from the Gospel with the words, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and concludes the reading with the words, the Gospel of the Lord. After the absolution following confession, the celebrant says, hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. The celebrant then reads one of four prescribed biblical passages, one being the familiar John 3:16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is said or assumed in each of these cases is that the people have been listening not just to the speaker, but to what God said or says. The words used in these passages that I quoted are non-committal as to whether the people are to be understood as listening to what, to what God once said by way of scripture, or whether they are to be understood as listening to what God is saying here and now by way of the reading of some passage from scripture. Jean-Jacques Fenomen, the Swiss Reformed liturgical scholar, to whom I referred in my first talk, is emphatic in saying that the listening of the people should be understood as listening to what God said or says. By way of reading of scripture, God addresses us. Or as Benaman puts it, the word of God is proclaimed by us reading. Let me quote another sentence. To read scripture is to experience the paschal joy. The Lord reappears. He who is the word to tell us of his love and his will to teach us who he is and who we are to summon us and to give us life. End of the quote. And Benaman claims that that understanding of liturgical scripture reading was the near universal teaching of the church until the Calvinist Reformation, when some reformed theologians claim that God speaks to us here and now, not by way of the reading of scripture, but only by way of preaching based on the reading of scripture. When Almond calls this permission, position inadmissible and contrary to the whole of ancient Christian tradition. He's criticizing his own tradition there. He goes on to argue that the reading of scripture is just one of three distinct ways in which God addresses us in the liturgy. Second is this, God also addresses us in what von Allman calls the prophetic proclamation of the word, that is, in preaching. And he highlights two ways in which this mode of God's address, the preaching mode, is distinctive. First, in the hands of God, the sermon is a basic means by which there takes place a direct prophetic intervention in the life of the faith and of the church, with the object of consoling these people, setting to rights, reforming, questioning, it shows that the word of God cannot become the prisoner of the church, but that it is always also external to the church, a living force which strikes the church from without. And second, Van Allman says, preaching is not merely the sign of God's freedom. It also manifests man's freedom, human being's freedom. Since it is that phase of worship in which the preacher can bear witness, his own witness, to the truth and reality of what has been proclaimed by the reader of scripture. Thus the sermon introduces into the service an element of witness bearing. In so doing, this is Jovan Alman, it expresses one of the deepest mysteries of the love of God. If God gives himself to us, it is to enter into the depth of our being and invite us to disclose him to the world clothed with our flesh, in this case, clothed with the preacher's flesh. So scripture, God's address, preaching, God's address. The third mode of God's address to us in the liturgy is what Van Allman calls the clerical mode. And what he has in mind is those moments when in the service the minister, by means of a biblical formula, 
declares and gives to the people the greeting, the absolution, and the blessing of the Lord. A traditional greeting at the beginning of the service, one of three options in the contemporary Catholic liturgy, is the celebrant saying, the grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Phenomena interprets this as God greeting the people by way of the celebrant pronouncing those words. In the present day Catholic liturgy, again, the celebrant after the confession of sins says, may almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. When Almond argues that this should not be interpreted as a prayer to God, addressed to God, to the effect that God will forgive the people their sins, not a prayer to God, but as God's declaration by way of what the celebrant says, that God does here and now absolve the people of their sins. You might wonder whether that's an overinterpretation of that liturgical formula. But here's Calvin's formula for the absolution. I quote, this is from the Strasbourg liturgy. Let each one of you who truly recognizes himself to be a sinner, let each one of you truly recognize himself to be a sinner and abase himself before God, trusting that the heavenly Father will be propitious to him and Jesus Christ. To all who in this way repent and seek Jesus Christ as their savior, now listen, I pronounce absolution in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That is as strong as absolution ever gets. Neither of the two rites of the Episcopal Church concludes with the blessing of the people. The contemporary Catholic liturgy does, however, and one of the options is the priest saying, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Orthodox liturgy also concludes with a blessing May the blessing of the Lord and his mercy come upon us by his grace and love, now, always, and forever. And remember, phenomenal interprets all of those as God blessing, not just the preacher praying that God will bless. In the traditional reform liturgy, there were three options for the closing blessing, two coming from the Pentateuch and one from Paul's letters. The two from the Pentateuch were these. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the other, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And the one from Paul's letters was this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Von Allman argues that all of these closing blessings, all of them, should be understood not as prayers addressed to God, asking God to bless the people, but as God here and now blessing the people by way of what the celebrant says. Suppose Phenomenon is right about this, as I will argue later that I think he is. That in listening to the reading of scripture, the preaching of the sermon, the greeting, the absolution, and the blessing, the people are listening to God addressing them here and now. It goes without saying that the understanding of God implicit in the liturgical actions of the people's listening, so understood, is that of God as one who speaks. More specifically, God is one who here and now addresses us. <clears throat> so let me pull things together. <clears throat> In traditional liturgies, most of the liturgical actions take the form of the people addressing God, or the celebrant addressing God. If phenomena is right, many if not most of the others take the form of the people listening to God's address to them. So the enactment of the liturgy is the site, the place, of mutual address and listening between God and the people. In the liturgy, we are joined with God in a community of addressers and listeners. Something stronger can and should be said. Not only is the enactment of the liturgy the site or the place, the locus of mutual address and listening between God and the church, the enactment of the liturgy is for that mutual address and listening. 
the people enact the liturgy in order that mutual address and listening may take place. Enactments of the liturgy are not the only sites in which we address God, nor are they the only sites in which God addresses us. I would say, however, that they are the principal sites in which mutual address and listening between God and God's people take place. It should at once be added that mutual address and listening don't constitute the entirety of the liturgy. The congregants kneel, they eat bread and drink wine and so forth, and the celebrant also addresses the people. The people address the uh, celebrant, the people address each other. But I think there can be no doubt that most of the liturgy consists of mutual address between God and the people. An essay in liturgical theology can begin from any aspect or component of the liturgy and proceed to articulate the understanding of God that's implicit or explicit in that aspect or component. But it seems to me that liturgical theology at its most fundamental will begin from the understanding of God implicit in worship as such. And then in the next chapter part, we'll move on from there to the understanding of God implicit in mutual address between God and the people. In Summa Theologiae, Aquinas begins with God as the unconditioned condition of all that is not God. In the Institutes Book One, Calvin begins with God as one who reveals himself in creation and scripture. In his Church Dogmatics, Bart begins with the word of God. And in each case, the beginning shapes the overall configuration of the theology that is developed. I think there are things to be said for each of those starting points. But my starting point on this occasion is significantly different from any of those. And it will shape the overall configuration of our theological reflections. Now, to bring it to a conclusion. I think that here is maybe the best place to raise an issue that must be faced, both by liturgical theology of all forms, and also by biblical theology of all forms. I have interpreted the liturgical actions of addressing God as actions of strong address. We address God in the expectation that God will listen to what we say, and in the expectation or hope that God will respond appropriately. Not everybody interprets these actions in this way, however. Some who participate in the liturgy believe that God is ontologically incapable of listening. A blend of philosophical and theological reflection, maybe with some bits of modern science thrown in, has led them to believe that God is the ground of being, or something of that sort. So though they join with their fellow congregants in saying the words of the blessings, the thanksgivings, the confessions, the intercessions, they do not do so in the expectation that God will listen to what is said, or in the expectation or hope that God will respond they regard it as ontologically impossible that God would do so. They can see that these are exactly the sorts of words one would use if one did expect God to listen, and they realize that most of their fellow congregants do have that expectation, but they regard it as theologically naive to believe or assume that God listens. Some take the next step of proposing an alternative understanding of what they're doing, when they participate in the liturgy. An understanding that they believe their fellow congregants would share if only they were theologically enlightened the way they themselves are. Others decline to take that next step. They're they're content to live in two worlds. The world of the enlightened intellect during the week and the world of saying the words of the liturgy on Sunday. Many of those who deny that God listens to us also deny that when that God listens to us, also deny that when we listen in the liturgy, we're listening to God's address to us. Here too, they believe it's ontologically impossible for God to address us, just as it's ontologically impossible for God to listen. So when we listen in the liturgy, we're listening to what the minister says, nothing more, or to what the reader says, or to what the leader of the prayer says, nothing more. 
The medieval Jewish theologian Moses Maimonides addressed his masterpiece, The Guide of the Perplexed, to Joseph, a fictional Joseph, an erstwhile student of his. Joseph is a devout Jew, young devout Jew, who reads the Torah and prays the prayers of his Jewish tradition. But Joseph is also a bright and devoted student of philosophical theology. And this combination of activities, to both of which he's very devoted, has left him deeply perplexed. The understanding of God arrived at in the philosophy classroom seems profoundly different from that which is implicit and explicit in the Torah and in the prayers. In the classroom he has learned, for example, I quote Maimonides, that the description of God by means of negative terms is the only sound description which contains no element of loose terminology and implies altogether in no circumstances a lack of perfection in God. Whereas the description of God by positive terms, on the other hand, imports polytheism and a lack of perfection in God. It should use only negative terms, not finite, not wicked and so forth. But Torah and the prayers are chock full of attributions of positive terms to God. So Joseph is confused and sees himself as, quote, faced by a dilemma. Either he follows his reason and rejects those expressions in Torah and in the prayers as he understands them, then he'll think that he's rejecting the dogmas of our religion. Or else he continues to accept the dogmas of our religion in the way he's been taught and refuses to be guided by his reason. He then brusquely turns his back on his own reason. And yet he can't help feeling that his faith has been gravely impaired. He will continue to hold those fanciful beliefs that he finds in Torah and the liturgy, although they inspire him with uneasiness and, and disgust, and be continuously sick at heart and utterly bewildered in his mind. That's Maimonides. The aim of Maimonides in the guide is to alleviate Joseph's perplexity by showing how the terms used for God in Torah and in the prayers can be interpreted so that what is said in the Torah and the prayers is consistent with what's been learned in the philosophy classroom. In Torah and the prayers, for example, we find the positive terms omnipotent, omniscient, possessed of will being applied to God. What we should understand is meant thereby is that God is not powerless, not ignorant, not distracted, not disinterested, all negative terms. So let me speak of a Maimonides-style critique of the liturgy and a corresponding Maimonides-style analysis of the liturgy. A Maimonides-style critique of the liturgy claims about some part of the liturgy that we have good reasons, philosophical, theology, or whatever, for holding that what we seem to be saying or assuming in this or that part of the liturgy is in fact false, or that what most people think they are saying or assuming is in fact false. It would seem that we are addressing God in the expectation that God will listen, but our philosophical theological reflections have led us to conclude that it's ontologically impossible that God would listen. God's not that sort of being. We say things which imply that we're listening to what God once said or is now saying. But our theological philosophical reflections have led us to conclude that it's ontologically impossible that God would speak. God is just not that sort of being. Maimonides style critique. A Maimonides style analysis of that compo component of the liturgy will then go beyond critique to propose an alternative understanding of what we're saying and doing in this part of the liturgy, a way that does not collide with the conclusions at which we've arrived in our philosophy classroom. We should not overlook an important difference the, between the critique and analysis that Maimonides himself undertook and that which I'm calling a Maimonides style critique and analysis. Maimonides focused on what was said about God in the Torah and prayers. His project was to explain how, should we, how we should understand the force of the predicates. 
My emphasis is not on what is a speech about God in the liturgy. There is speech about God in the liturgy. My focus is on speech to God and by God in the liturgy. In this difference lies one of the differences between traditional systematic theology and liturgical systematic theology. Well, in subsequent lectures, we'll have to take serious account of whatever Maimonides-style critiques of the liturgy prove relevant. And in case some critiques prove compelling, we'll have to see if we can find a plausible alternative Maimonides-style analysis. But from what I've already said, it will be clear that I'm not persuaded by the critique which says that God is ontologically incapable of listening or speaking. And I'll defend that viewpoint in later. Thanks.